when I work with my clients that have insomnia, I tell them no matter what, I want you to wake up at the exact same time every day. Let's figure out what that time is that's opportune for your life. Let's figure out this time that works best for all of the different circumstances you have. And yes, I understand if you're a teenager, you may need to binge on a little sleep and sleep in a little bit. What can we do to find a wake up time that's as close to what you can do regularly and consistently? So that way, all of those other chemicals in your body can keep reacting in a predictable manner. Welcome to The Uptick, brought to you by the New Jersey Center for Tourette Syndrome and Associated Disorders, empowering children and adults through education, advocacy, and research by sharing the stories and experiences relevant to the TS community. Hello, welcome to this episode of The Uptick. I am speaking with Ben Mooney, an occupational therapist based in Colorado. Ben has been an OT for 23 years, and he specializes in sleep and insomnia. He also does CBID and was recently certified in that. And finally, Ben has an affinity with our community as he also has Tourette syndrome. So Ben, I, I wanted to kick off the conversation with asking, do you tick in your sleep? <laughs> yeah. Hey, Michael, thanks so much for letting me be a part of this awesome podcast. I'm honored to be here. Do I tick in my sleep? The answer is yes. We're learning so much now because we can use brain imaging to see what's going on in the brain. And there's interesting stuff about ticking in our sleep. People with Tourette and tick disorders tick throughout the entire night. We're often ticking, but there's a difference between like the slow wave deep sleep and REM sleep. In REM sleep, we're actually supposed to be paralyzed because you don't want to act out your dreams. So in theory, when you're in a dream state, your body should be in a state of paralysis where you're not able to move. And so we tick in deep sleep, but there's not as much synaptic connectivity in deep sleep. In REM sleep, people with Tourette and tick disorders actually tick more often. The explanation from scientists that study sleep is that the basal ganglia, which is, it's sort of like our no, our go, no go system. And it's where the ticks sort of originate from. The basal ganglia seem to be used in our dreams. So as we're dreaming and we're creating these basically test sequences of our autobiographical history, the, the basal ganglia are part of our, the memories and the, the, the images and the experiences of our dreams move through the basal ganglia, which causes us to actually tick more. So even though we're technically supposed to be in more of a state of paralysis, as our autobiographical history is churning through these dreams and our motor history and what our brain knows to do filters through the basal ganglia and they create the ticks that are already in there. Wow. I mean, what's I mean, it makes sense if we're activating a part of our brain that's also implicated in, in ticking, then when that's activated, maybe you tick more too. We do tick more in REM sleep. REM sleep, is it seems like the basal ganglia get filtered into REM dream sleep. And so we do tick more in REM sleep. In like slow wave sleep and what we would consider to be like that deep sleep, often there's less what we would call synaptic connectivity. There's less commotion in your brain. There's less efforts for your brain to try to like communicate. Deep sleep is critical for the memory storage. And it's also critical for movement. When we learn and we learn coordination of tasks, how we do that gets stored in deep sleep as well. But as that's happening, and when we're in deep sleep, the waves are slower waves. So there's not as much synaptic connectivity. There's not as much cueing for our body to produce ticks, for our brain to produce ticks at those times. We are ticking still, but it's not as often. Now, when it comes to like, you notice you're ticking more in your sleep, everyone is so different with ticks. It's pretty universally accepted that when we're more stressed, we're taking more off. Stress plays a huge role. If we have deadlines or I notice this with myself, I also, I have a child that has Tourette and when I watch him playing sports, 
he's ticking more often. So yeah. if we're doing these things that are getting our nervous system all, oh, it's moving fast and there's a lot of stimulation inside of our nervous system, we certainly tend to tick more. Perhaps if we're doing activities before bed that are kind of getting our nervous system moving a little bit more, there's probably, and I don't know this, I'm just guessing, there's probably a correlation there. What I noticed for myself, ever since I can remember, the stillness that I experience when I lay down to go to sleep in the darkness and there's no stimulation, this is often the first time of the day when I'm moving slow enough to be aware of my body, when I'm mo moving slow enough to actually think about my movements. Yeah, and yeah. Course, my tics are really, they're highlighted then at that point. I can, I'm so aware of my tics. Oh, yeah. And then I get frustrated with myself because I'm almost about to fall asleep and I'll do something. You take yourself awake. Yeah. Yeah. And I also have OCD. So this time period is dangerous for me because when I'm finally still and I have mental stillness and there's darkness and it, it, it's an opportunity for me to go right into my obsession. I can analyze the conversations I had earlier that day or how can I predict the future outcomes and how can I prepare myself? And if I, if there's going to be potential confrontation, I can analyze how am I going to respond to that? What am I going to say? When I, I remember when I was a kid, people would make fun of me for my tics. And I would always use that time before going to sleep to think about ways, something else I could say to defend myself or something I can do tactfully or ways that I can avoid these situations. This was my time where I tried to figure everything else out. But the problem is, this isn't when I'm supposed to be sleeping. It really ate into my opportunity for sleep. It was a dangerous path because I would get myself into this cycle night after night. And essentially, it just became part of my behavior. I would get in bed and I would start thinking about the same cycles over and over again, the same life problems. This is really common with insomnia. A lot of the people I work with, whether they have Tourette or tic disorders or they don't, go through this spinning in their mind when they're laying down in bed. And so that's kind of a long explanation, but essentially there is a time to deal with mental health. There is a time to deal with these parts of us that want to solve problems. And I allocate time and I teach people to allocate time during the day when we can rationally think through this, we can give those parts of us attention that need the attention. And then we can say when we're, when it's time to go to sleep, I hear you, you want to come up and you want to try to solve this problem. But right now, it's time to sleep. We will allocate time tomorrow for this. Why do we sleep at all? Why can't we just keep going? Half of our brain turns off, the other half keeps going. Why have we not evolved out of sleep? Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. A third of your, your life is spent sleeping. Of course, I'm a little biased here, but sleep is, in my opinion, the most important thing we do. The way that we record memory is through sleep. So we have a, a hippocampus, which is sort of like a thumb drive, and all of the details that we record during the day, like what car is next to you at the red light, how the food is arranged on your plate. Everywhere you go, your brain is just constantly recording all of these details. And by the end of the day, you have millions and millions of bits of information just from that day alone in your brain. And your hippocampus is, is that thumb drive that's just storing all this data. And somehow... That data needs to be filtered out. A lot of it's unnecessary to us, but there's so much data that is important to us as humans, and it needs to get filtered into long-term storage. And so one of the key things that happens in slow-wave sleep is that data is transferred into the cortex, into long-term storage banks, and it's based on what we need. So that gets filtered in sleep. That's one of the key things right there. Our body goes through... So much growth in sleep. I think 75% of human growth hormone is released in sleep. Our muscles are relaxed and repaired in sleep. Sleep is, again, like I said, where memory storage takes place. We absolutely need sleep to sort of reset our nervous system, let our organs relax. There's toxins that are flushed out of our brains. Like our brains actually shrink when we're in sleep. And the CSF, the cerebral spinal fluid, washes over the brains and it clears out toxins. It clears out the amyloid plaques. Th that's where we have that association with dementia, Alzheimer's. This is one of the key processes in sleep. And then, of course, there's this 
amazing, beautiful REM sleep that we have. And that's phenomenal because in REM sleep, what's going on is it's basically our brain creating test scenarios for life. So we have this huge autobiographical history of information. Somehow we need to test this out to create our version of reality and to be prepared for what's happening in the future. So our brain basically has all of this data and it creates stories. These are our dreams. Our brain's 30% more active in REM sleep than when we're actually awake fully. And it's just creating these sequences of potential events and how we would handle that information. When you think about like emotional regulation or being able to find balance with your mood, when we hash this out in our dreams, we're so much more relaxed and prepared and able to essentially handle stressors in our day-to-day life. It's interesting how our bodies have evolved for, for millions of years. And one of the outcomes of that is, is we, we work in cycles. Our body functions in terms of cycles, and, and that's where we get the circadian rhythms. I'm wondering if you could speak to this and the importance of circadian rhythms in what, when it comes to proper sleep. It's everything. Let's bring this back to Tourette and tick disorders too. When people with Tourette and tick disorders tend to have a little bit of overactive dopamine and they have elevated adrenaline and they also have decreased serotonin, 5-HT synthesis. The modulation of serotonin leads to melatonin being released. We have this beautiful kind of wave and sequence of predictable chemical reactions in our body and sleep and so the whole circadian day really just helps our body move in, in these, this beautiful system of fluctuations of neurochemicals. If you look at how the sun rises, basically, and how our body's hormones and the way the, chem- the neurochemicals are released in our body match this beautiful day and light patterns and all of this other stuff, there's ways to be efficient to basically live our best life. There's ways that we can kind of move to understand just how the circadian day can help us so much more. I think what I'm hearing is is so much of it is we should be more attuned to what our body is telling us, like when it's giving us these signs. I find sometimes at night I get tired and feel sleepy at 8 or 9 p.m. And I might push through that to try to get something done or I'm finally getting time done with work. I'm enjoying the night, whatever. I I ignore it. And then it's 10 or 11 PM and I'm not tired anymore. And now I'm trying to go to sleep and, and I I don't feel that I'm, I'm sleepy. Is that my body telling me I should have gone to bed at at eight or nine? You know, maybe that that's what my body cycle wants to do. Uh, Would that be a, a right reading of it? Absolutely. Yeah. Our bodies are so intuitive. We're in this day and age right now where we have technology, we have social media, we have work stresses, and they're right at our fingertips. It's not like you have to go to your office and turn on your computer. You're getting pinged with your emails all the time. And what happens when we do that? The light goes into our eyes. And so the light going into our eyes automatically reduces melatonin. Additionally, we're creating this like cortisol reaction where we spike our cortisol, our heart starts racing, and we start thinking and analyzing. And so many of the processes that in theory at that time of the day should kind of be winding down, they get into a little bit of a tailspin and our nervous system doesn't really know how to react to that. In our nervous system, it doesn't know if there's a threat that's potentially life endangering. It doesn't know if when our cortisol rises, if we're on a trail with a wild animal or if we're just getting an email that indicates that we have to do more work. Our heart's racing, the cortisol's pumping, our nervous system feels like maybe it needs to speed up. And so it gives the body a little bit of a jolt and you don't feel tired. You had mentioned the lights on the phone. I, I know a lot of the phones now, they have the, the nighttime mode. There's like the yellow brownish tint to it, or it's not as bright. What are your thoughts on that? Are our technologies getting better because of the fact that people are using their phones at night and we want to protect your brain when you're doing that? Technologies are getting better, no doubt. And people are catching on just how absolutely critical sleep is. It's becoming more mainstream. And Doctors are getting better education, and it seems as though everybody understands 
in theory that this is the case. Now, having said that, the writers of these TV shows, like Netflix makes it really easy to start a new <laughs> show. Yeah. And in our brains, it's really hard sometimes to say no or to not try to get that next fix. We as humans are kind of fragile in that area where it's so easy for us to just say, oh, I'll be okay tomorrow. I'll be all right. The next, I'll, I'll get this down. I, I had, I'm having bad sleep. I'm in a phase right now where I'm not sleeping good, but I'll figure it out. It's sleep, right? I can do this. It's not always happening that way. People are turning this into more chronic habits. So it's, yes, technology is getting better, but our behaviors are, they actually are getting worse. The statistics show that more than ever now, people are struggling with sleep. There's more rates of insomnia. There's more prescription sleep medications than ever before right now. I tend to be on one extreme end. I really try to get my body and my family, I try to get them to follow this. My wife doesn't always follow, but I try to follow the sun as much as humanly possible. When the sun's going up, I'm getting the light. When the sun's going down in the evenings, I try to turn off as many lights as possible. I try to keep it low. I take it to an extreme. And I have had a long history of horrible sleep. So what I'm learning is that I need to do this. This is for my nervous system. This is something that I absolutely need to do. I don't use my phone at night. People say, shine the light down, turn the flashlight on, shine the light down. For me personally, I won't, I don't use red light. I don't use my phone angle down. I just don't use technology and I have to be pretty diligent myself. If somebody actually has true insomnia and they're not getting that refreshing sleep, I feel like we have to try to do as much as we can to really help our brains and our bodies find relaxation. And light is a huge deal. I'm thinking about how the stats you brought up on how our sleeping behaviors are getting worse. And I think a lot of this is exacerbated by our society. Like you said, people sending work emails at, at 8, 9, 10 PM. And so if you're home, you're looking at your phone, you happen to see it. And now I'm on that rabbit trail going through my work emails and something I wouldn't have done otherwise. I'm also thinking of college students cramming for exams or staying up late. How do we continue to coexist in a society that's making these demands on us or, or tempting us without sacrificing our sleep like that. Is consistency more important than getting a strict nine hours of sleep every night? We have to be practical here. We have to be realistic. Life is, it's complicated. We're expected to be more productive now. And society is going to reward the people with jobs, with promotions, with things that are important to our human society in financial ways, because they are the ones that follow up and they, they get that job done and they sort of like force themselves into the night to do more work. This is something that is heavily rewarded. Ultimately, at some point, we have to stop. <laughs> we, there's no replacing sleep, period. There's no replacing sleep we know when it comes to like taking medicine and all of the this abundance of pharmaceuticals available, there is truly zero medication better than sleep. There's nothing that's going to regulate your body. There's nothing that's going to help you physically, mentally, emotionally, and with all of the systems more than sleep is going to do. So if you're trying to diet or if you're trying to exercise, or if you need to cram and get a lot of information in your mind, the best way to do all of those things is with great sleep. There's studies that that demonstrate very clearly that you're going to score better on a test if you sleep the night before versus if you stay up and cram. Now, yes, you may be able to retain that information short term to answer your questions on your test better the next day. But that information is not getting stored in your long-term storage if you're not getting the sleep to get it in there. It's gone. So when we think about ourselves as like efficient humans trying to perform as best as we can in the society, getting time and making time for our sleep opportunity is critical. Like I said, with prescriptions, we know there's more sleep prescriptions than ever before being written right now. We know that there's... 
it's obvious. This is kind of anecdotal, but people in society are not in their healthiest mental health um, status right now. There's There are a lot of people struggling with mental health right now as we're in this this state of hyper productivity and social networking and connection. It's abundant. It's almost like we're in an experiment here okay. that started with the internet and we have access to all of this dopamine that can get kicked up with likes and social media attraction. We're in an experiment right now as humans with our nervous systems that technology is delivering and there's no turning back, obviously. So we have to learn how to use it to our advantage. So when you talk about like the consistency, the way I work with my clients, the way I tell my clients about consistency is I use a comparison to traveling. Like if you're traveling in different time zones, you t- most people, when they travel in different time zones, they go east or west, they kind of get thrown off a little bit. Maybe they fly to Europe and there's a period of days and in some cases even longer where it takes somebody a, a while to adapt and to change their nervous system and to basically adapt to the new time zone. When people wake up and go to sleep at different times of the day, even if they sleep in like a few hours on the weekend, almost what they're doing is changing time zones. That's, whoa, whoa. that's not exactly true because yes, the sun is rising and setting at the same time, but the, this flow of chemicals in their body that happens when they wake up later and then they go to sleep later and then they try to get back earlier and they're doing this every week, trying to catch up and then trying to get back on track with their sleep. There's a huge argument to be made for consistency. When I work with my clients that have insomnia, I tell them, no matter what, I want you to wake up at the exact same time every day. Let's figure out what that time is that's opportune for your life. Let's figure out this time that works best for all of the different circumstances you have. And yes, I understand if you're a teenager, you may need to binge on a little sleep and sleep in a little bit. What can we do to find a wake up time that's as close to what you can do regularly and consistently? So that way, all of those other chemicals in your body can keep reacting in a predictable manner and essentially create this wave that pushes your body into sleep consistently each night. Can you speak a little bit about caffeine? Yeah, yeah. So let's start with caffeine. Our brains produce something called adenosine. Adenosine is this amazing substance that as we continue throughout the day, the adenosine builds and connects. So our brain has these receptors for adenosine. They basically are like puzzle pieces. And as the day goes on, the adenosine binds to these puzzle pieces. And the more that happens and the more we store that adenosine in our brain, as the day goes on, we get tired. So adenosine creates sleep pressure. In the night when we sleep, basically the adenosine gets filtered away and then we start over again. So the adenosine builds as our day goes on. And then we hit a certain point where we have an enormous amount of sleep pressure in our brain. Our, those receptors have caught on to enough adenosine chemicals that basically our body is aware. We start yawning, we get heavy eyes, and we can feel sleep pressure growing and building in our body. And of course, then usually that time of the day, the melatonin is released and and our nervous system knows this is sleep pressure. It's time to sleep and we get forced into sleep. That's kind of how adenosine works. Caffeine is is a really fascinating um, substance. It's, It's the second most traded commodity in the world, only behind oil. There's a reason for this. It's a psychoactive stimulant. It stimulates our nervous system. How does this happen? When I talk about those little puzzle pieces, those receptors that adenosine uses to attach to our brain, caffeine has the exact same, the same binding receptor. So caffeine can actually get into our brain and bind to the brain and block out the adenosine growing in our brain. So caffeine sort of blocks the adenosine in our brain from creating more sleep pressure and and hence as a result we aren't feeling as tired. So caffeine kind of keeps us down by binding to the brain like that. As the caffeine wears off, 
most people probably are aware and who have, have experienced Shit. that crash, that caffeine crash. So yeah. as the caffeine eventually loses its power over our brain, it, its capacity to influence our brain, the adenosine finally connects and suddenly we feel that crash after having the caffeine. So anyhow, the way caffeine works, if we're using caffeine too close to bedtime, there is a huge likeliness that even if you don't respond to caffeine as much as other people do, even if you have a high power mm-hmm. to caffeine, you're still influencing the architecture of your sleep because your body isn't going as deep into sleep as it might go if you don't have that caffeine and you just have that pure adenosine buildup in your system. But caffeine will, in most cases for most humans, prevent sleep within that life that it has inside of your brain. Interesting. So can we say a certain time that's true for most people, like I've heard no caffeine after 4 p.m. or 5 p.m. Or are you hesitant to even make those kinds of guidelines? Uh, yeah, uh, everyone's so different. Almost everybody I work with has a history of using a lot of caffeine. Mm-hmm. Most people, they drink caffeine and then they feel that crash and then they drink more caffeine Yeah, and they start feeling crash and maybe they have something they have to do. It's really important to them. It's really hard to say a blanket rule for caffeine. However, when do you go to sleep? If you're going to sleep at 10 o'clock, for instance, let's rewind the clock by eight hours. And let's see if you stop caffeine at, at two o'clock, how is that going to influence you? Just notice and observe how your sleep is that night. And for sleep, a lot of times it takes more than one night to run an experiment. Mm-hmm. Your body has to get used to, the, to everything adapting after a few days of, of repetition. Somewhere around eight hours before bedtime is a great place to start. It's also the doses of caffeine. How much caffeine are you having? Are you starting caffeine first thing in the morning and then just kind of going from that point on? I believe there's a a strong argument for when you wake up, giving your body, your natural chemistry, a chance to wake up with you versus putting a psychoactive stimulant in your system right away. And so there's a lot of work we can do with caffeine And it's not just how late you're using it. It's how early you're using it, how often, what the dose is, and certainly how late you're using it. Caffeine's a great antioxidant. There's a lot of great benefits for caffeine. It's just also something that we have to be really aware of. I know you treat a lot of patients with insomnia, and it sounds like one of the the best practices is figuring out what what's the patterns. What are all the patterns going on in your life, in your sleep? When are you waking up? When are you going to bed? How restful was the sleep you're getting? Are there any apps or, or tools that you recommend to clients that can help with measuring some of this and tracking it? Yeah. What I use with my clients, it's called CBTI Coach. It's a free app. I think the VA produced this. And it only takes about three minutes to fill out your data in the morning. It just tracks your sleep patterns. You answer about five or six questions and rate the quality of sleep because sleep is truly a subjective measurement. The CBTI Coach app has suggestions. It'll take your information and and plug it into a formula that it, it suggests for you. There's apps, there's sleep assistance. There's one example where, well, there's more than one example, but basically a guy just babbles and just talks. And doesn't even finish a sentence ever. He just, he basically just talks and the subject content that he talks with just whines. And then he'll find a connection at the end of one statement and then move it into a whole different unrelated thing. And he'll do that for hours. And some of my clients, we try everything. They can't get their brain to settle down into sleep, but they try that and it works. It works so well for some people because what's happening is they're not thinking about their life and they're not going into their loops. They're letting the content of what this guy's saying ramble on and it takes them down and they slowly just fade off into sleep. For them, it works amazing. There's other people I work with that try that and it doesn't work at all. It's such an individualized process. But ultimately, meditation is a great thing. Our brain waves start slowing down when we're meditating. I often have people stretch in the dark before bed. And again, there's no stimulation. We might practice like some kind of like transcendental meditation. They're just focusing on one mantra. And when they notice their brain 
going, trying to solve something or trying to fix something or trying to go into a different direction, we bring it right back to the mantra. Essentially, you're slowing down the brave wings. But really what I'm saying is for everyone, it's a little bit of a different approach and we all have to just experiment with this. But I will say putting time into solving this is time well spent. It's worth it if, because if you're not sleeping, when you start getting that good sleep, it's 100% worth it. it. Everything is easier in life. For any of our listeners that may want to talk to you or an OT like you specializing in sleep, where should they turn to? Are there any good resources to find? Is this something any OT can do? How do, how do we find one of those sleep experts? There's actually not a lot of OTs that do the sleep work. I got my training on sleep at Colorado State University, and they have this incredible program. They have these professors there that are just so dialed in, but there's not a lot of OTs that do sleep work. The thing is, here's what I would say. The internet is full of, there, there are so many options now. I would suggest basically, if one of your listeners is really struggling with their sleep, first of all, 100%, call me. I always offer a free call, no matter what. And maybe I can help somebody find resources too. But ultimately, talk to your doctor about it. Talk to a healthcare professional. There are sleep experts and the science is so good. There are so many options. Just do an internet search and schedule that appointment. Book that call. Talk to somebody that specializes in sleep. Find out if it's a good fit for you. I would say the hardest part for most humans is making that first step. And with sleep, it's a really interesting thing because we're so programmed to just say, oh, we, I, I sleep every night. I'm going to figure it out. Or we're also so programmed to say, I'm in a period of, of bad sleep in my life right now. I know what I need to do. I'll figure it out. And then months and months go by and it's the same problems. And it starts becoming a little more of a behavior thing. The hardest part is to say, I don't think my sleep is great. I need to talk to somebody and make that phone call and reach out. I really would encourage people if they're struggling to just reach out, to do an internet search, find a sleep specialist, talk to your PCP. Primary care doctors will have referrals and just start the conversation. And also, I, I'm just going to say this is my bias, of course, but I'm not a doctor. I don't prescribe medication. So this is my opinion that I'm sharing here. Starting off immediately by taking the sleep medication is, in my opinion, sleep medications are sort of like band-aids. They solve a problem temporarily. They make your brain shut off, but you're still not getting the architecture of sleep that you need to get that good regenerative sleep growth. So my suggestion is to really work harder on the behavioral aspect. If you're not sleeping, some people truly have medical problems where they cannot sleep. But for most people, there are behaviors that they know that they can do. They, there's behaviors they can change. And with modification of behavior, you're going to do yourself a huge favor by learning how to modify your behavior to get that good sleep versus just taking a, a sleep medicine. Yeah, difference between treating the problem, treating symptom. Any other uh, tips or advice you have for our listeners or best practices that you find you're making often to your clients? There's one thing that I'll share. A lot of people come up to me, my friends, clients, people come up to me and they want to talk about sleep. And they know I love talking about it. And everybody wants to talk about their bedtime. Everyone wants to talk about what time they're going to bed. And that's like how they want to start. They associate bad sleep with bedtime behavior. And it's true. Of course, there are plenty of associations with bedtime behavior. In my opinion, when we start with wake up time, we can lock in behaviors so much easier. So I would say, I would suggest to somebody that struggled and maybe they've tried different things. I personally really like to get my clients working on wake up times as the number one priority. If we can set a consistent wake up time and we can keep that going, even if you have a horrible night of sleep. So it's three in the morning, you're wide awake, you're furious because you're, you have something that maybe you need to do the next day or whatever. You think to yourself, I'm just going to sleep in. I'm going to sleep in and capture my sleep and catch up. I understand why you feel that way. It makes total sense. But if you really want to hard reset your insomnia, or if you really want to try to get your body 
consistently moving. If you create that wake up time and you stay consistent on it, then you create this cascade of effects that's going to build the sleep pressure. And if you do this for consistently for three, five, seven days in a row, and you keep that wake up time, you're going to notice your body's naturally building that sleep pressure. You're going to feel that sleep drive, that intense need to get to sleep. It's so much easier, in my opinion, to start by working on wake up time. It's really easy to create patterns that way. Yeah, we have spinning it to, to approach it a different way. And also think about what you're doing during the day. We haven't really talked about diet or exercise or like reducing the impact of stresses on our life throughout the day too. And all those implications on our sleep as well. Our listeners have a lot to take away from with this. Ben, it's been wonderful having you on the podcast. I hope to chat with you again here. To any of our listeners, this is Ben Moody, occupational therapist based in Colorado. If you're looking to speak with them, you're welcome to reach out. You can also reach out to the New Jersey Center for Tourette Syndrome, and our organization can help connect you to a sleep expert as well or to another therapist or professional that you may need. So thank you so much, Ben. It's been great having you on the podcast. Thanks so much. And if anyone's listening, if you're struggling with sleep, especially, I've been there. I feel it. I feel it. It's so hard. It feels so helpless. And there is so much that can be done and it's worth it. My website is mooneywellness.com. Please feel free to reach out and call. I would love to connect with anybody and also just start that conversation. Start it with anybody. I'm honored to be here. Thanks, Michael. Well, thank you. And thank you all for joining us. Thank you for listening to The Uptick, brought to you by the New Jersey Center for Tourette Syndrome and Associated Disorders, empowering you to stretch the boundaries to live your best life. The NJ Center for Tourette Syndrome and Associated Disorders, NJCTS, its directors and employees assume no responsibility for the accuracy completeness, objectivity, or usefulness of the information presented on this podcast. We do not endorse any recommendation or opinion made by any guest, nor do we advocate any treatment. <laughs>